Gavin, I've just started the recording. Cool. So hello, folks. Um, if you want to give your name and what institution you're from as well, th um, that's always helpful. Hello, Rob. So how are things on the north side? Because down here, it definitely is, as you say, a bit sunny and showery down here too. Half clouds, half sunshine. Typical summer. So everyone, um, great. So my name's Gavin Henrik, and I'm from Brickfield Education Labs. Same weather in the north. Thank you, Alison. That's, that's good. Aberdeen. I, I lived in Aberdeen for seven months until I escaped. No, no, it was it was it was great. It was just over winter. So it was very, very cold and very, very grey. But it was it was really beautiful in the summer. So we're gonna be talking about accessibility and instructional materials. And you know, it's it's a little bit of a challenge, I guess, you know, when we're trying to get people online and especially in the last year and people are trying to use the materials they have and sometimes accessibility isn't at the the top of their um their mind when they're doing things they just want to get something up and i think that that's what this is going to be about and i'm going to get you to think a lot and maybe to contribute in chat or whatever so please do otherwise we'll end end quicker and um, we have our nine people here so um but I will start my presentation now. Um, so, okay. And screen share. So, okay. That's cool, and I shall remove my video. Instructional materials and assessment. I remember a, a lecturer saying to me, you know, what's the point of having instructional material when all our assessments are designed to be exclusive, not inclusive? Um, where they are literally, oops, sorry, where they're literally um, not thinking about um, what to do. They might show an image and ask people to talk about the content in that image. So also therefore, if you can't see the image, it's not very helpful as an assessment. And I know that Rob and probably others are really looking at universal design for learning. And I think that accessibility is that is a key underpinning of that. Um, and when you, you, you think differently, it isn't necessarily more work. And there was a good quote that, you know, um, it's only more work if you haven't thought about it at the beginning, right? If you think about it at the beginning, it's just doing it in a very specific way. So anyway, let's let's move along. So and if you disagree or agree or want to contribute in while we're going through this, please do. So I always look at this sort of quote around accessibility as a, a thing, because it is this multi-legged system. It's usability, it's inclusion, it's accessibility. And the key thing for me is this bottom phrase. It's a, a web that works for everyone. And so content has to work for everyone. Okay? Um, I remember in school, I mean, I remember there was a kid who was deaf or hard of hearing, and they would have to sit at the very front to have a chance of being able to understand what was going on in the in in the class and mm -hmm. it's that kind of thing which you the onus was on that person nearly to to solve the problem that the, of the barriers that were being created by the nature of the classroom but online we have the technologies to both have the students take more ownership of that but also for the institution and teachers to take more ownership of that and i think that it is really key that it is something that we all try and create this web and learning environments that work for everybody. And this is no more so in Tim Berners-Lee and all those others who came together to create this contract for the web. I was making the internet affordable and accessible to everyone. Because um, affordability is important when COVID hit and we all went through the chaos and challenges of the last year. 
some of the accessible content was inaccessible when the students didn't have Wi-Fi at home or didn't have a laptop at home, or didn't have the right type of laptop at home. So I didn't have a Windows machine because they had to go through some sort of VPN system. Um, I remember there was someone I had um, given one of my old laptops to and had Linux on it, and it was unusable by them because they absolutely required Windows 10 to be able to do it. So it wasn't just a device. It was very, really specific to be able to do anything remotely. And so that's an affordability challenge, both in internet and, of course, in Ireland, it's a geographical challenge. You know, I certainly wouldn't say that we have the concept of countrywide um, broadband. So affordable is literally like that. It's that first step, you know. And then everything else sort of comes from that. So you have to think about that. And how does that impact content? How does that impact assessment choices? So if they're having to do their access over their mobile phone, and I know in COVID most telecoms, or some telecoms at least, changed their policy on bandwidth. But if they're having to do everything over their mobile phone and they're burning through their data plan, that's going to cost money. And if they're having to do video sessions the whole time, that's going to cost more money. And forcing them to have videos on is going to cost more money. And so literally, each decision that a teacher can have is around. These are the choices. You literally create barriers for people or don't create barriers for people, as the case may be. And that's sort of all of it put together. Because it's also, when you're starting to do stuff with content, it is about following the standards. And the standards are technical. And if you don't know them, then how are you supposed to follow them? It would predictability. It, it shouldn't be that if every course in an LMS looks different, is named different, and when someone wants to get their slides from week one, just before exams from a few of our modules, and they're all named in different places and different courses or whatever, that's not going to help them. That's creating barriers. So it is reducing negative impact of disabilities on access, but it's, it's again, it's about for everyone. And sorry if I go on about that, but the key thing to me is understanding that it isn't just catering for a, min a minority. It's catering for everybody. Because not everyone wears an arrow on their head. Not everyone declares a disability that they may have. It's like the big discussion around video, forcing students at, at home to be showing their, their video, and especially if the platform doesn't allow them to have um, a virtual background. Then you end up with, like I have, a horrible curtain, or in other cases, you have their bedroom or wherever it might be. Anyway, so this is your first task, folks. Um, I'd like you to open up your online course space, whatever you're using, Moodle, Blackboard, Desire to Learn, whatever it might be. And look at the content that you've got there. Just so I just want you to just make a note of it yourself. What types of content? Have you got Word documents? Have you got PDFs? Often online courses are like PDF City. Um, not always, but sometimes. Do you have multimedia? Have you got videos in there? Have you got SCORM objects in there? So make a note of those. And, and if you feel OK about it, share some of us into the chat as well. But for I'm just going to give you one or two minutes just to self-audit what you're currently doing. Okay, I'm just checking the chat there. Nobody's put anything in, so hopefully you're all busy looking in your courses. Well, I'll give you a moment there.
Okay. So think, keep your content in your head or on your notes. I want you to think about the content you create and how you go about creating content. And this is sort of simple, really. So the first one is about structure and layout. You know, often you'll see a lovely Word document, 30, 40 pages, and it won't have page numbers. It won't have a table of contents. It won't have a logical structure. There's no headings showing up when you open it up into Word or to see the navigation in Google. And all it looks like it, visually it has headings, they're not real headings. And it's always one of the things, I mean, when I'm creating materials, I always start off with building that structure, putting in a title page, putting in all the different bits before I start building the content in it. But how often do we do this? How many of the materials you have print okay, but aren't as navigable for any for, for everyone with the format that they have? And then, of course, if you switch this into PDF and whatever, you're going to have more issues as well. That you need to have bookmarks for all those headings and so on, and have saved it correctly. But so layout and structure is really important. Um, you just can equally apply when you're building a web page. And to me, this is the one thing that people should be able to do well. Okay. Uh, I mean, content accessibility, there's a lot of it, okay? There's a lot of the rules and the guidelines and so on. But there are certain things, and that's why I'm just focusing on six or seven things here, certain things that you should try and always do. And this first one, getting a good layout and structure using proper headings, I think is key. And do look at one or two of your documents, hopefully while, while you're looking at it now, and see, does it seem to have good headings? Has it got page numbers? Does it have a table of contents? Someone's going to be able to easily find something in that Word or PDF document that you've given them. Yeah. So saw a presentation there recently where the contrast wasn't great. And it wasn't as readable on a shiny screen, definitely for me, because I was looking at it on my mobile. So color and the contrast of text is, is important. But often you're constrained by your brand. And has your brand been tested for accessibility of the institution? The colors that they prefer to show, do they, do they work? Are they OK? And who should say that they're not OK? Is it you? Do you raise your hand and go, hey, hold on a second. That doesn't meet the legal requirements. That's always a good one. If you tell them technical requirements, ah, if you, yeah, that doesn't meet the legal requirements for content accessibility. I know it's the legal thing is people don't like to hear it, but you know there are laws there for a reason to ensure that we actually think of this. Because unless there is sometimes a penalty, people don't think about it. They don't prioritize it. And avoid meaning with color alone. I've seen so many, so many web pages where they drop red and green in, and not even bold behind it, just to add color into different parts of a web page or a document. And if you print it out, it's gone. Because I mean, who prints in color? Actually, if anybody here does print in color, say it in chat, please. But I must admit, I haven't printed in color in years, and I've got a a really good color printing machine, like two foot to my left. Has anyone here printed in color? So as soon as you create a printed copy of a, your do, of a document or a web page or whatever, and after relying on color, it's lost. That meaning is lost. And and that's just, again, a, to everyone. But color for people who are colorblind, there are similar issues. You haven't printed anything in years, Rob. You tree hugger you. That's awesome. <laughs> I must admit, really big documents, I just have to print. I have to print. I just find consuming a huge amount of stuff on digital hard um, or harder than, um, than printing. Does anybody else not print at all? Do everything on digital? OK. 
Okay. Ah, well, since working from home, not at all. You see, well, I suppose I've worked from home from for about eleven years. Um, so I've got one of these really cool multi-page sort of scanning things and printing things. And yes, color ink costs a lot. <laughs> it really does. Uh, so that's why I print stuff out. But um, another one is about links. I did think. Again, this is something which I've seen so many times people being given, I won't say bad advice, but certainly not the best advice. I mean, a link, if you hide all the other text, the link should describe, the text of the link should describe where it's going to. And if you have click here, it doesn't describe where it's going to. And uh, I don't know, if they want to mark up, they want to mark up their um, their notes. Have you found a really good markup tool yet that works with PDFs? Must admit, I haven't. Um, and I've marked up a lot. I mean, I used to scribble on so much. It was um, it's great if it's a Word document you can just add stuff in, but if it's a PDF, I just haven't unless you pay for like Adobe. Stuff. It, I just haven't found something that good yet. Um, but if anyone has, please share it. Um, so the click here thing, and there's loads of simple words like that, read more, whatever it might be. You have to read the paragraph around it or the sentence before it to understand it. And that doesn't make it easy. Because we, when we're looking at a page, we'll either read down to the left and across to the right a bit, or we'll hop doing hotspots where all of the links are. And so we don't want to have to read all the text if we're trying to get to somewhere. And the same with a URL as a text. I mean, if you were to have, I'm just going to paste it in here. Yeah, Tom, that is certainly, I'm definitely there with you. You, if you ever, if you're a 365 house as an institution, there's no reason for not having a PowerPoint and Word documents in there instead of PDFs. They're much more usable. You can make them more accessible. It's so much better for students. You know, because worst case scenario, one of them is going to use OCR and turn it into a Word document that might not be as accurate as the one you could have given them. So yes, make make them work to get something of a lesser quality than you can give them with less work. So what, if you're going to have something or someone reading that long link, right? And you often see it in emails or whatever. And I will say it's great seeing the um, like the, the email that comes out for the registration from out is like join session or something with the link hidden behind it. And that's having something meaningful. Okay. Have, have, have any of you come across really terrible link names or text being used for links? Google Doc ones are excellent. They're like about half a mile long sometimes, or it seems like that. Anyone else? OK. Images. Mm -hmm. Obviously, some of you will know that I do an awful lot of stuff with Moodle, although I do stuff with other systems as well. And there's a tick box there when people are adding images going, description, not necessary. And that was up to last May, right? And I just can't imagine how many teachers probably just ticked that, having no idea that they were creating a barrier for people who either the images weren't loading because of bandwidth issue or people who were using a screen reader. They weren't deliberately creating that barrier. But the interface didn't actually ask them well. It does now. Now it says this image is decorative only. So if they tick it now to not bother putting in a description or alt text, then they are making a choice to create a barrier. But if it is decorative, fine. But if it's not, having those descriptions is important. And 
remember seeing a great presentation by Alistair McNaught, where he had the same four, he had the same image used in four different contexts. So the descriptions of it was going to be four different ones. And the one I use is imagine a dog standing in a field on a sunny day. So you, in one, you could have a context of freedom. Another one could be sort of a, getting it back to nature and how you would describe that. Or one, it could be about isolation and loneliness. And I think in COVID, many people have been that dog standing in the field with a sunny day outside. And I think that those descriptions are really important. And if the, the context of that image is important to the material, then it should be done well. But you must just not say what's in the image. You must include that context of what is important in that. Um, and if there's sometimes you can see images with text on them. I mean, every I mean, one thing that triggers me is on Twitter, people post a quote <laughs> being inspirational, and there's the the alt text is image. Inspirational for some and not for everyone. Um, another thing that bugs me recently is conferences who do these lovely visualizations of summarizing what the conference was. Well, that's, that's really good and helpful to some, but not to all. I did ask two of them there recently. I'm going, do you have a text alternative for that? That wasn't even considered. It wasn't even considered. So it's so important to consider images, because if images conveying meaning, convey it in text as well. And complex images might just need really long descriptions, might need multiple paragraphs, not as an alt text, but multiple paragraphs afterwards explaining what it's about. Again, otherwise, you maybe try a different mechanism than using an image to describe it, which will probably be text-based anyway. So anyone come across in their courses or when they're doing things where it's, they've seen images which just were not described well, were crucial, but were not described well. Have you any examples yourselves? Okay. Doo -be -doo -be -doo. Multimedia. Oh, Rob, oh, that just makes me a very sad panda. A very sad panda. Oh. I mean, I shared our schedule for the conference, which is running to for today in the next two days, the middle moot, um, as a Google Sheet, because Anyway, I tried to put it into a web page. It wasn't, wasn't great. Um, so I left it in a, a spreadsheet because that's probably the most accessible, easy way. Anyway, but multimedia. So I did a re recently recorded a one hour presentation for another conference. And we also created the, the, the captions for it. And then uh, my marketing and comms person spent seven hours correcting them. Now, it possibly could have taken me less because I'd have known the content more. But captions and subtitles, you know, these are these are key things. And how often do we do this? I mean, sometimes you might have a script that you're doing and you will release it um, as well as a video. Or you use something like YouTube that auto creates it. And they're better than nothing. Well, some people think they're better than nothing. But it does take a lot of effort. And if you're going to rely on video and audio, these are things to consider. And then table data. So like a, a timetable. <laughs> Putting it as image breaks all of this. But yes, good to have a caption there. Good to have proper row and column headers. Often you'll see them without it. So if we look at documents, and this is a screenshot of a PowerPoint, which has an image in it. And you can see over the right, it has an accessibility checker built into it. OK? Um, this is great. 
a lot of content was probably created on Microsoft Words of years ago, 10 years ago. And some of them haven't changed content-wise in that time. But opening them up in Office right now, and again, doing it like you would a spell check, clicking on check accessibility, will then help you fix most of the issues. Is it everything? No, but you know what? As long as you're moving forward and tomorrow is better than today, that's really important. Okay. And again, you can see sort of a bit more detail there on the right um, with regard to um, Office. Um, and then in Word as well, here's an image. It found no alt text and it prompts it up on the right. And you can leave it there all the time. So when you make a mistake or haven't finished something, is it will prompt you. Now, unfortunately, with Google, there isn't something free in equivalent. There's something you can pay for, a thing called Gra Grackle Docs. That's Grackle. And it does a small amount of checks, which is, again, enough to make it better. Um, just for interest, how many people here are Google or 365? You want to just type in, say, G Suite or 365 in the chat. OK. Looks like Microsoft is winning here in this particular um, battle. I have both. We use. G Suite for our developer team collaboration, and we use Office 365 for all the professional side of what we do. So if you think about media, I mean, and do drop in some other examples. It could be video audio versions of lectures. Oops, not of lecturers. Oh, always typos, terrible. Um, podcasts, audio conversion of a document. You might have an MP3 version of a document. Could be a virtual classroom recordings. Could be some instructional videos. What other multimedia do you add in to your courses? Adobe Spark pages, OK. H5P. Well, must admit, wouldn't really consider H5P media unless it was because you'd have to put video and audio in it, would you not? Would you consider it media? Well, you do. Um, but if you're going to have audio and video from these, then how do you get text? Alternative. So one is obviously if, you've, if you're giving a presentation, you can write your script in the notes. And so you have your script already written before, beforehand, so you can share that with people. And if you leave it in the PowerPoint, it's the notes that they can see it. Um, you can look at also generating text from the media. YouTube, YouTube can also generate it, and people can submit fixes and I mean multiple languages. You can have Zoom, where it also does um, captioning as well and, and create a transcript for you. Or you can pay services like Otter AI. Um, or you could be using PowerPoint Live, where it's automatically um, streaming a set of um, captions for you and a full transcript as well. So what do people use here? Do, do people use any of these options? Or how do you go about creating text versions of multimedia? Also generate from Panopto. Okay. YouTube and Zoom. Okay. So one of the things you can also have one of the integrations like what we do, or there's other products out there as well, where it will also convert text into different formats. If you have PDF, you can do that. But this is sort of the reverse, because you can also do where 
you can actually create an audio export or an EPUB, those kind of things. These are other formats. So like H5P, you could create a full EPUB with details, that kind of thing. Um, but I want you to consider now, what alternative formats do you think would be suitable for, let's say you have a chapter from a book. So you possibly have it as a PDF from scanning at the moment. What better alternative do you think could there be for that? Recently, using our embedded sort of uh, OCR scanning, we had a very badly scanned book completely converted to a Word document, for example. An audio version, absolutely, Susan. And I think there are audio books often available for um, some of the materials. It really depends what you're using, obviously. But creating one is a good thing. Um, but often to create that, you need to first convert your scan into, into text. And what about help instructions? How do you currently do that within your learning management systems? Are they downloadable PDFs? Are they web pages? How do you currently provide that kind of information? Moodle books, Rob, OK. That's a very accessible way of doing it. Creating web pages is a really good way for um, people to be able to use their browser controls to maximize their accessibility experience. The Blackboard page, Susan, so similar again. What about a book, a full book? So, so some of these, I remember, Seeing Pearson books, they were like four gigabyte SCORM objects. And obviously, um, you might have a printed book, but then what formats can you get those provided in, or how would you go about doing it? It's a bit similar to a chapter, obviously, but it wouldn't necessarily be scanned. I think that it is a, a lot of the books now are becoming like multimedia things, but like your H5P course presentation, Rob, some of the books from publishers, they're going beyond just a digital version of the paper book, and they're trying to embed extra materials and stuff within them. Um, but I do think it's a challenge, if whether you're going to have a, an EPUB, or you might have a Mobi for Kindle, or PDFs, it's about making sure that they are accessible and usable. And when you're thinking about what materials you're going to use and books you're going to require, you should be thinking about the formats that are available to them or for them, not just that it, ha it happens to be the best one. And information leaflets. I mean, I've seen lots of information leaflets sort of printed up and put on walls in colleges about this, that, and the other. And the one interesting thing I've seen recently is I've seen a lot of them with a QR code on the bottom, which will bring to a web page version of them. So that that can help, because then they can suddenly access screen reader technology in that. And that even if that student can't see it, someone might say, hey, you know what, you should do this. But that, that requires other people to be involved. But how are you going to handle that kind of thing if you're going to have information and people are walking around that just can't see them? How do you make them aware of it? I think that's a challenge. I think when you bring environment into it, when they're in your learning management system, it's one thing. But if you're trying to give guidance for someone when they walk into a lecture theater, um, that's going to be a, certainly a challenge. Then what about lectures themselves? So how do you go about currently making your lectures more accessible? Obviously, in this, we don't have 
a subtitling system here for Blackboard Collaborate. I think as Rob mentioned earlier in Zoom, you can do auto subtitles. I think Panapto as well auto generate. But how others what other ways do you go about trying to make your lectures more accessible? Well, I certainly think a recording is the first part. And ide ideally, give the recording in advance, flip the classroom. So people will be able to listen or read the material in advance before coming into the lecture. And the lecture is then more uh, interactive piece, but or even just give them as a recording. And the lecture is then more of working, doing something. Um, how many here do actual full lecture recording for what they do or for all their lectures? OK, let's talk about the A word, so assessment. Typically, two types of assessment, a sort of a, an assignment where they're creating something and uploading something, and an online quiz. Let's take the first one. What are the accessibility challenges that people are going to face with regard to um, uploading an assignment? I remember a lecturer telling me recently, or last year, where a student had printed out something, scanned it, and then uploaded the PDF. The lecturer was blind, so that wasn't going to be very useful because OCR wouldn't work very well. So the solution for that was to ensure that the students were aware that they have, have to upload the Word document version, and not a scan of a printout. Now, how other, how else do you go about making assessments more accessible? Often you might want to choose to give certain different time frames for people, giving not an extension, but a, a person has a certain disability, then that you will give them an extra amount of time because maybe somebody has to type for them. So when I had, my, had hurt my arm doing judo, that, that I'd have had to have someone writing for me if I had an assessment in the following few weeks. So as students choice and format, Rob, yeah, that's universal design for learning because if they can choose how they're going to do it, then it'll be something that they have control over that format and that method. Whether it's uploading a Word document, whether it's recording a, a audio or a video presentation. I think that's one of the things where real accessibility is about looking at exactly how you're use, you're creating your content, your choices, what restrictions you, and barriers you're creating each time you use one, and trying to avoid any if you can. And sometimes it may, might need to rethink what your assessment is. And the same with quizzes. I mean, often you'll see images used in quizzes and describing them sufficiently that it doesn't give the answer might be problematic. So you might need to come up with a different question if you want to do a quiz to address the same learning outcome or the same competency, depending on how you're doing it. I think assessment is where it's access accessibility becomes really important because just the traditional MCQs are not necessarily going to deliver for everybody in the same way. And so it is about having students think about format. Some mightn't cope well under the high stakes pressure of a timed exam. But given a different format and a different um, time scale, they would be able to demonstrate sufficiently to pass and meet those learning objectives and competencies. 
I think that one thing COVID will certainly have thrown up in the air is thinking about this and thinking more. It's even in leaving cert, the fight between a written exam and a grade, um, a derived grade from their work over a few years. You know, it's a, people seem to have a, a religious, uh, I suppose, just gripping onto this written exam as being the only way or the best way. So thank you all for your, your interactions. So I think we're going to end up finishing a bit early. I've been hoping for a bit more and obviously you've interacted really well, but there's only a few people here. Um, I mean, I think this is a goal and it's, you could say create a web that works for everyone, create a learning environment that works for everyone, teachers and students. I think that's really key as well, because when you're talking about learning materials and assessment, you need to be sure that what's being created is suitable for the teacher as well. So if the teacher is going to be marking in an environment that might be quite noisy, you don't have their headphones with them, then audio submissions aren't going to be as great unless they're auto converted into text, for example. So there's you, you're going to have challenges in the whole way around all of these things. And the purpose of this session was to really just get us thinking a little bit about some of the options, some of the constraints, some of the barriers, rather than necessarily say, do it this way. It was just about getting you thinking. Has anyone got any sort of thoughts they'd like to share on audio, if you want? Don't be shy. Come on, contribute in if you want. I'm assuming that they can just turn their audio on, can they? Yes, they can, yep, just at the bottom of the screen. Does anyone have any questions or anything that they'd like to ask before we wrap up? Okay, well, if not, thank you very much for your time. And I hope you found the reflections useful for you. Thanks, Rob. Although I'm sure you could have done this, Rob, yourself. Gavin, if you're happy for me to, I'll end the recording now. Yep, that's fine.